you might imagine you're sitting at your bench sometime, probably just working with some FPAs, building things, and someone sort of comes along and asks a question, and you kind of look, have a conversation. You're like, hey, I'm wondering, how did FPAs actually create opportunities in computing? And, you know, and also before we do that, can we do a quick review over the FPAs so we kind of know where we're going with this? Like, sure, that'll be great. And, like, someone probably in the corner going, be careful what you're asking for. You may not want to do that, but okay. So anyways, let's have this conversation. So FPAs are basically this combination of logic routing analog elements with IOs in there. They're basically sort of the mixed signal um, sort of generalization of FPGAs. And there are chips that have been built. If you kind of look at the, the system on chip FPA built that's built at Georgia Tech, this really cool chip actually has been used for all sorts of classifiers um, that have actually shown and demonstrated this sort of factor of a thousand improvement uh, over other custom digital kind of approaches for doing these embedded structures. And there's a whole bunch of things that have been built, including things that are small enough to fit, in your, fit into cell phones and so forth. And there's been discussions of how you would do this and scale this down to smaller IC processes. And, and this is all really fun stuff, probably a bit of a longer conversation, depending where you want to talk about things. But there's been a good 20 years of development of these chips at uh, Georgia Tech across a, a range of different processes. and Basically, what we found over time is that the overall cabs and the overall structures basically converged over time, uh, pretty much from experimental experience from building so many different structures. And what's really important is, is unlike an FPGA, which will actually not just be uh, computational blocks and routing, where they need to have vector matrix multipliers and other aspects in it to kind of make it relevant, a lot of those vector matrix multiplier elements show up straight in the crossbar fabric because of the floating gate elements that are being used there. And we can store charge, which then allows us to have an element that can be completely off, completely on, or just about anything in between. And so this gives us programmability, all again in standard CMOS. You can see kind of what a first crossbar array looks like. And this really gives you the ability of computing in memory as well as, you know, talking about computing in the switches themselves, and the switches are not dead weight in this case. So this really opens up a lot of possibilities when you start asking about computation. And so this is, this is you know, a good time to get into the into depths of computation, and particularly talking about the analog numerical analysis of all of these techniques. And you're thinking, well, maybe this is where I can just, like, take those off a little bit while she just rambles on on some details. Maybe some of you are thinking that. Some of you are probably thinking, hey, it's always nice to have a mid-talk mid nap, you know, check email, whatever. Although maybe that's, this is not, maybe another way to talk about analog numerical analysis is it's really a way to kind of address sort of key questions of accuracy and computation. So for example, people will talk about that pristine digital computation, which is perfect, there's no errors in it, and it's always better than any sort of noisy, approximate, analog kinds of things to which people are going, well, clearly that's always true, and people just know that that's just a given, right? And you think, no, it's actually not even close to true. And, uh, and it requires some things to look at there. You're probably thinking, what? Or some people out in the, in the peanut gallery are thinking, wait, that's just crazy talk? What, do you, what are you meaning? Well, if you actually think about numerical, the numerical analysis stuff, one way to, to think about this is think about the different topics that you might have for digital numerical analysis. And one way to think about it is what would a year-long course in numerical analysis cover? And after you get through the preliminaries, what you realize is that everything starts with uh, LU decomposition solving AX equals B in different forms and iterative approaches, as well as other aspects. But, you know, things get more and more hard, get harder and harder as you go out and you get to differential equations, but you really hope the semester mostly ends by then and you really don't want to talk about PDUs because it's really, really hard. And there's sort of a log of complexity of these things. Well, if you were to do an analog numerical analysis class, you'd actually find that those some of those hard things like ODs and PDs are what you would do first. And LU decomposition would sound like the really tough thing to do. And, you know, other sort of linear equation solutions are actually harder to do. And there's a lot of interesting things around it. It is sort of a, a case that digital tends to be good about starting precision and analog is good about the inter intermediate numerics. So not surprising that one does uh, linear equation solutions and one does ODEs, and this has a tremendous amount of implications. Of course, then again, you might start finding out some new results, like for analog, and you go, wait, you actually can do some iterative uh, linear equation solutions. 
Um, actually, some very recent work doing this actually on FPAs, solving it, uh, things that look very similar to what you might have done in a linear circus class, and you actually get to then set up a differential equation that converges to the solution you're looking for. You're thinking, that's really cool, and you know you can start looking at trajectories and solutions and eigenvalues and rethink condition matrix and condition numbers and all of those really good things. And you get about a 100x improvement, which then makes you look at this figure and go, oh, maybe it's more like that. And you think, well, and as we keep developing and the whole concept of analog numerical analysis keeps developing, you go, huh, what happens if I can do LED decomposition in the analog sense? And it's not that horrible. Mm, that changes this conversation for high performance computing even further. And these are really fun conversations. And it just would be a wonderful path. We can kind of walk down that path in a beautiful forest of knowledge we can kind of move through there. And it would lead to questions of computing and, and, and complexity theory. And that would be great. But that's just not going to be our conversation for today. Um, so we won't go through that forest of knowledge today. But what we do want to do is kind of work our way back up and think about the FPA structures. And if you look at a structure like the, the SOC FPAs, we've got like probably half to one million floating gate elements in this process. And, and so that gives us a lot of things we can do with it. Somebody might come by and go, okay, hold on, hold on. That's a lot of elements. So do I need to like design these and do something specific with each one for every design? I mean, it's still better than doing layout, don't get me wrong, but it really feels like machine code. So to, to address this question, we actually have sort of an open source tool set to sort of enable these FPA development. And it really also shows the whole complexity of this infrastructure that goes from a whole hardware infrastructure uh, and even sort of bridges into the tools like built-in self-test and abstraction and mismatch and other kind of aspects to a whole tool framework that ends up moving us towards education. But this whole framework is all open source and uh, available, and we can really do some interesting things with it. And, you know, again, it's just fun. It's like, look, there are design tools. There's graphical design tools to do analog design. Um, and this is all built in Scilab and XCOS, uh, which is all open source, built in and um, built in a virtual machine uh, that's all, all running under Ubuntu. And you can actually, like, pull something down, pull down an example, see a whole bunch of block diagrams, and actually see something work. This, it's just really amazing what's possible. So I can actually take this and actually go and design hardware and um, hook this up with maybe, uh, you know, maybe an extra um, USB scope. And all of a sudden we got, hey, I can sign it as well as I can use the same infrastructure then to do the hardware measurement. So I can have one tool to, to simulate target design and measure everything. And so you can imagine this is huge for anyone who's building stuff. This is huge for anyone who is... Uh, in a, in a teaching perspective, it opens up a whole range of things of even remote learning and other opportunities there. And so you might go, wow, that's really cool. I wonder what's in those design tools. And then you look at it and you go, uh, okay, um, maybe there's a little too many details there. Let's move on. Um, you might also have another question is like, well, okay, how do you abstract this? I mean, because you have these block diagrams and you think, well, that's pretty cool too. Um, and you realize that analog has abstraction at many levels. You know, we talk about a simple bandpass filter. It actually has multiple levels all the way through. And this is true throughout all the infrastructure of to where you actually compile it on the chip. And this is all done automatically. In fact, even one of the example elements to using this block diagram has a whole bunch of these block, mix signal blocks and pieces that are analog, digital, and assembly language code all pulled together. So this is really cool of all the levels that are possible. And in case you're curious, you can even build like all the way from input through classifier all through the same infrastructure. This is pretty neat. And so people go, well, why are these concepts just kind of so unusual analog design? Because I, you know, have learned, have seen analog design, and I don't hear much of this. Well, analog design is kind of artistic. You really have people sitting at their canvas building stuff, and almost everything is sort of custom built and built individually. And that turns out to be great, and there's some beautiful design, but reuse is something that isn't done very often. And to kind of break that mode, we have to kind of think about, you know, how do you sort of um, structure this? And programmability is essential. But, um, you know, kind of even looking at a couple years ago, there was the question of, well, if I want to start to build a bridge to a, to a new space, I need to think about something different. Okay. And so at that point, there were sort of three key questions looked at this in terms of crossing over. Um, and crossing over into really enabling this both in, in research and in, in experiment. Um, 
And some of you might be thinking there should be a Monty Python skit that should break out, and that's a great idea. But what it actually comes down to is that, you know, you take transconductance capacitor design, which really is known as being the highest bandwidth for given energy, very efficient approach, lowest noise for given bias current, but has always been, in, been plagued by needing programmability and making sure I get enough linearity and then dealing with all the offsets. And you think, oh, okay, yeah, so I can see why no one would touch that. Except that programmability can all be done by programming the bias currents in all the differential pairs going into these, these say, transconductance amplifiers or other related approaches. And, oh yeah, um, I can also set the parameters in, in interesting ways, uh, which allows me to then set linearity and also set offsets. And you think, oh wow, this is exactly the technology I need for a programmable approach to make this work. Very cool. So you think, okay, this is great. So now if I'm going to sort of optimize and build this further, I'm going to say analog design is just like digital design. No problem, right? Where I've got, you know, standard cell libraries and I've got high-level concept and I can just compile all the way down and get to GDS where, you know, I've got some nice logic reduction things so I can get to the logic case or some IP blocks. All this works great. And you think, Shh, yeah, analog design should be similar, right? And you're like, well, not really. These are... The, co the codification of this is really starting, but classically in analog design, it kind of looks like this. High-level concept, lots of question marks with lots of smart people, and eventually layout appears. And you're thinking, okay, that's a problem. Uh, it would be nice if there's an analog standard cell library. That's already uh, an interesting question. And maybe if I had it, I could compile and place and route, and you're starting to think, a lot of questions here, a lot of things I don't know quite what to do with. You say, well, okay, let's at least think about making a standard cell library. That sounds like a great idea. Well, that too is harder said than done. But if I had it, how would I approach it? Well, remember we talked about a whole FPA tool set. And there's a lot of pieces in here. But not to pull you all the way through it, realize there's a technology file that describes the entire chip. And from that, I take a high-level design and can actually go to targeting a full chip automatically. This is done routinely for many years now. Top part of this is all high-level abstraction, and then the lower part is a place and route that goes onto the chip. Well, I could imagine that place and route being pulled out into going into GDS. What would I need? Well, that's really where I'd put the standard cell library. So it could really enable a path through design that was done on an FPA and cut and pushed all the way through into hardware. I could also imagine taking that standard cell library and now actually making even new FPAs with it. And you're like, ooh, that would be really cool. Okay, so I see a reason to do this. This would be really neat. So what work has been done on standard cells? And it's pretty much nothing. It would take another 20 seconds to go through pretty much the entire history previously. Because most people really just think this is impossible. It's really, to be fair, programmability is the only thing that makes this even slightly realistic. And there was sort of a starting discussion uh, earlier uh, in 2020 that gives you a sense of how this might approach. And I'm sure there's someone in the corner going, I bet there's more floating gate circuit in this, right? I'm like, well, yeah, of course. And it turns out that, for example, there's a, a development right now doing this in the Skywater 130 nanometer CMOS fab. Starts with the floating gates, that actually helps, sets the pitch, sets the infrastructure, sets the programmability. Um, and pitch that we're looking at right now is about six microns, which is awesome. And from that, you can build all the other things, and that kind of, you know, gets rid of all of the other questions. And it's an amazing thing that you can get out of that. Uh, and there's a whole lot that could be said in terms of the, the structure, but this really allows you to uh, handle this as well as potentially compile new FPA devices. So this has been great, and there's a whole bunch of things that we can now sort of summarize. And so now, looking in summary, we can ask, well, what have we learned today? Well, we've learned lots about FPA devices and their capability, which includes the reprogrammability and reconfigurability. These really enable and motivate analog and mixed signal design school tools, computation, and from those tools, synthesis is definitely a possibility. And so from that, we can talk about a useful standard cell library is definitely possible, enabled entirely by the fact that we have FPAs there in the first place. Those programmable techniques really enable the standard cells. It also allows me to build it into a flow that likely can be all modified with digital tools. And uh, lots of these things are in development right now, which then allows us to talk about the sensor, sensor to output uh, classification and structures all over the place while still keeping the energy and area efficiency in place. So with that, I really thank you for watching the video. All questions and comments are absolutely welcome, and I really appreciate it. And I'm sure questions are coming. 
Yeah, coming quickly. Thank you very much.